<clears throat> okay, tonight our last three chapters on digital and our last three chapters in ELEC 120. So uh, tonight we're going to get her done as, uh, who is that dude? Larry the Cable Guy. Larry the Cable Guy. Mildly entertaining until he ended up with his own show. And I'm like, unbelievable. The blind leading the blind. <laughs> I'd like to watch a show hosted by an astronaut, highly educated, the optimum peak physical mental performance. Instead, it's Larry the Cable Guy. <laughs> Today, we're going to go out and get us some vittles. <laughs> Anyway, chapter 35, the continuation of digital. Tonight we're going to talk about sequential logic circuits. We talked about binary. We talked about digital. What is digital? One of two different states, stable states. We talked about the logic gates. Um, we talked about simplifying logic gates because um, what ultimately we're going to use logic gates for is solving repetitive problems solving repetitive problems and um, uh, evaluating those with a digital circuit. So these digital circuits were, were the first way of doing this with 100% performance on a, on a regular basis. So in simplifying the logic bi diagrams and using Boolean algebra, we're able to break down a complex scenario into a simple Boolean expression and find the s smallest number of components that'll do that job for us. And these are off-the-shelf digital items, digital logic circuits. Tonight, a little bit different, chapter 35 is going to be sequential logic circuits. After completing this chapter, you're going to be able to describe the function of a flip-flop, identify the basic types of flip-flops, draw the symbols used to represent flip-flops, describe how flip-flops are used in digital circuits. I could do that right now. They're used quite well in digital circuits. You're going to be able to describe how a counter and a shift register operate. Identify the different types of counters and shift registers. Draw the symbols used to represent counters and shift registers and identify applications of counters and shift registers. Flip-flop. Sounds kind of goofy. Sounds kind of odd. Um, but a flip-flop is really a fundamental building block of a lot of complex digital architecture. It's a bistable multivibrator whose output is either a high or a low. That's, of course, going to equate to either a 1, which is a logic high, or a 0, which is a logic low. The RS flip-flop is the basic flip-flop. It has two outputs and two controlling inputs. The outputs are always opposite or complementary. This here is an example of a set-reset flip-flop on the top that's made out of NOR gates. Remember the NOR gates? Okay. So the way that this works, I don't want you to necessarily, I mean, in your free time, feel free to sequence through ones and zeros. But I want you to more understand from a functional block what this thing is used for. It's real simple. We're either going to set this device or we're going to reset this device. That's why it's called a set reset flip flop. So we're either going to hold a one right here or we're going to reset it back to a zero. So that's what this whole component is about. Holding either a, a, a state on or a state low. The way we're going to do it is if we want to set the flip flop, we put in a one here, a zero here. The one here is going to make this Q go high. The output here, Q0, is the complement of Q. So whatever this is, this is going to be the opposite. That's just how this thing's wired together. So if you want to set the flip-flop, you put a 1 in here. You get a 1 out here. If this is a 1, this is a 0. If you're setting the flip-flop, this reset better be 0. Because if you put a 1 into set and a 1 into reset, that's really a prohibitive state. Okay? You, you just wouldn't want to do that. And there's no way of predicting exactly what it's going to give you as an output because it's a prohibited state. It's a set, reset, flip-flop. That's like the key on your car. You know? I mean, 
you either want to start the car or shut the car off. You know, if you turn half the key one way and the other half, the, you're going to break the key. I mean, you're just being stupid. It's just, it's, what are you trying to do? He's trying to start the car or shut the car off. What are you trying to do? And it's really the same thing here. I'm trying to be a little bit silly about it, but it's just that reset flip-flop. You're either trying to set it or you're trying to reset it. So if you're both putting in two highs, with that being a prohibited state, it sounds like a programming error. Something is wrong with the circuitry because you'd never want to be setting it and resetting it simultaneously. Make sense? Now this down here is a set knot, reset knot flip-flop. And the way that this works is it does the exact same thing, but if you want to set it, you need to put in a logic low. By putting in a logic a low here, that's going to give you a Q out that's high and a Q not that's low. If you want to reset it, you've got to basically put in a logic low into the reset. So the only reason we have this negative level logic is for exactly that, negative level logic. Sometimes in a circuit, the active signal is that transition from high to low. Here we would use that as a, as a set knot for a set knot flip-flop. So chances of you seeing a set knot, reset knot, or set reset flip-flop made out of NOR gates or NAND gates probably pretty remote unless you're working on some old legacy equipment. Um, I actually I know I'm dating myself but I saw this when they did this with transistors. You would put a bunch of transistors together in a circuit simply to hold a high state or a low state. Last time I actually saw it with this with with gates was uh, probably 18 years ago. Students in here we had them working on a commercial fishing radar and um, w some of the circuitry was a set reset um, flip-flop and it was made out of simple um, uh, nor, uh, nor gates just like this and I don't think they ever got it working which is fine by me because I really didn't I wasn't comfortable with students working on our radar in the lab you know what's that smell what's for lunch it smells pretty good it's my arm <laughs> you know it's got to be careful when you work on microwaves this is more likely what you're going to see um, and this is a, a specific component that's designed to be the set reset flip flop. This is going to come in a dual inline package like a logic gate. In multi-sim you could call these same devices up on, um, uh, for the components. And uh, this is the schematic diagram for a set reset flip flop. And again the way that it works, you put a high into set, you get Q out, that's a high. Q not is the complement of Q and you either want to set the flip-flop or reset the flip-flop. If you put both in as high, it's a prohibitive state. Down below is the next variation of the set reset flip-flop and it has the inclusion of this clock input, this fifth input clock. And um, whenever I saw a clock, I think of a clock as like having hands on it and it's like on a, on a wall clock what they're talking about here is actually like a rhythm. This is almost more like a drummer, percussionist than a band that sets the pace of the music, the beat of the music. This is basically setting the beat at how often it's going to be looking at the set and reset inputs to see what condition it wants to be in. So the clock flip-flop, the third input is, I love this word, required required. If you don't connect that clocked input, flip-flop is not going to do anything for you. It's not even going to be a flip-flop. It's just going to sit there like, uh, right? You've got to give it that clocked input in order to enable the chip to allow it to be a set reset flip-flop. The third input is also called the clock or the trigger. And basically there's a variety in digital of different ways that they'll clock that input. One is active high, which, let me go back a slide. Okay, this here is active high. So when I put in a high voltage, five volts into this, excuse me, when I put in a high voltage here, this is going to be enabled. So if the set goes high, it's going to set the flip-flop. If the reset goes high, it's going to reset the flip-flop. Make sense? If I put an inversion bubble on this input right here, it's going to be an active low clocked input. So whenever the pulse goes low, like if I'm putting a square wave into it, whenever the square wave is low, this chip will be enabled to be a set reset flip-flop. 
And there's also what's called positive edge triggering and negative edge triggering, which are probably the, mo the two most popular methods of triggering in digital. What that's going to do is the transition of the waveform of the square wave that you're feeding in as a clock signal, when it transitions from low to high, that's when it's going to pow, enable the chip just at that moment in time. So it's almost like taking a snapshot. Go ahead, and what's the condition right now? Not what's on right now, one Mississippi, two Mississippi, three Mississippi, off. That's what an active high enable would be. Or if it was an active low, what's enabled right now, one Mississippi, two Mississippi, three Mississippi, off, pow, and it goes high. With, act, with positive edge triggering, it's that transition. What's, what's going on right now? So in today's complex digital circuitry, where there's all kinds of numbers and stuff sequencing, they like that transition because it allows them to kind of set the pace and be right on, right on score with the timing, if you will, to sequence the logic conditions through the chips. So by far, those are the most popular. Now, a D-type flip-flop is useful when only one data bit is to be stored. It's also referred to as a delay flip-flop. A lot of people argue whether the D is for data or the D is for delay. Don't lose sleep over it. The most popular JK flip-flop is the JK flip-flop. The most popular flip-flop is the JK flip-flop. Why? Because it's the most popular. It's the most popular because it has all the features of the other flip-flops. So what other all the other flip-flops could do? The JK could do them all. So it's really like a universal flip-flop. So these are going to be the most popular. So if you're an engineer or you're going to get stuck on Survivor Island and you can only bring one flip-flop with you, the choice would be the JK flip-flop because it could do everything all the other flip-flops can do. And its schematic symbol looks like this, the J and a K. Don't ask me what the J and K stand for. I don't have a clue. Survived my entire career not knowing that bit of information, and I like it like that. All I know is the answer on the test, the most, it's the universal. Could do everything all the other ones could do. Now, really the fundamental building block of a lot of these arithmetic logic units are counters. Counters. And basically all these digital counters do is count a sequence of numbers or states when activated by a clock input. Now, the reason you pay college tuition is to learn these big words. The big word tonight is modulus. It's kind of a cool word. The modulus of the counter is the number of counts through which it progresses before returning to its original state. So you understand like a counter that could count up to a um, hundred different sequences basically counts as high as 99, right? And on the, after 99, it basically resets itself to zero, zero, which is an active condition. So it's a hundred different conditions that it could count. The highest number that it could count to is 99. You understand that difference? We don't think like that because we count 1, 2, 3, 4, or 5 instead of 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. Now flip-flops can act as simple counters, believe it or not. There's really two different ways that we could wire these things up. Could either be synchronous or asynchronous. Synchronous or synchronous. Asynchronous counters are referred to as ripple counters. So whenever the count increments, it basically ripples to the next stage. Synchronous counters are synchronized. That's why they're called synchronous counters. Each stage is clocked at the same time. That means we've got a clock pulse, or that per percussionist I was talking about, that's setting the pace of the data being sequenced through. So synchronous counters are timed counters. Asynchronous counters are considered to be ripple counters. A shift register is a sequential logic circuit widely used to store data temporarily. They're constructed of two flip-flops wired together. They can move data to the right or to the left a number of bit positions. The most common application for a shift register 
is serial to parallel or parallel to serial data conversion. And this is something that's happening on a regular basis inside computers. If you use a mouse, if you use a keyboard, if you use the internet, if you use an air card, if you do anything of that nature, what you're using is a form of serial communication. Your computer operates in parallel sequencing of data. Parallel sequencing is like watching the Kentucky Derby. And they're off. The gates open and all the horses come running out. Ones and zeros. Okay? So in a typical computer now, you could have up to 64 doors that open simultaneously and load in one sequence uh, 64 ones and zeros instantly into that processor. But yeah, we communicate with our mouse and the keyboard through serial communication. Your internet connection at home probably is done through a modem, and that's serial communication. So a shift register is going to get the serial, basically it's going to be like a traffic cop, waving it all in and then loading it all in one fell swoop. Then you load the next sequence and then you shift it. That's serial to parallel shift register. Make sense? If you communicate to your printer, you're probably connected at home to a USB printer. USB stands for Universal Serial Bus. Serial. Serial is a sequence of numbers. The computer's processing in parallel. So what it's got to do is take that parallel load, load it, and then sequence it out in serial communication. So fundamental building block of a shift register is a flip-flop. And that's exactly what we do. And it performs just so many operations per second it boggles the mind of these ones and zeros being shifted in simultaneously and you're clicking your mouse. It's really amazing. I know how computers work and it amazes me that they work as well as they work because there's so much going on so quickly. Shift registers are also used for temporary storage, basically memory. Temporary storage. Memory serves to store digital data on a temporary or permanent basis. Many different types have, have evolved, each for a particular application. Memory is built from storage registers, and storage registers are built from flip-flops, and flip-flops are built from logic gates, and logic gates are built from transistors. So ultimately, all of these are made up of nothing more than transistors put together in complex configurations. The two types of memory devices are random access memory, RAM, and ROM, which is read-only memory. RAM is used for temporary storage of programs, data, control information, etc. Provides random access to the stored data. Has the capability to both read and write data. Stored data is considered to be volatile. That means if you drop it, it will explode. It's not what volatile means. Volatile means that when you uh, turn the power off, you lose the data. Volatile memory, you lose the data. And out of those types of RAM, there's really two types that are available. One is static and one is dynamic. That needs to be refreshed periodically. Each has its pros and cons. We're not going to get into it at this level of class. ROM allows data to be permanently stored. Permanently. Allows data to be read from memory at any time, and it's considered non-volatile. So when you shut the power off, this program still remains behind. It can't be altered. Basically, there's a number of products that have ROM now. Your DVD player has ROM. They'll talk about updating it, actually, in a, in a bit. But your, your CD player, your DVD player, I had a problem with mine. I looked it up, and there was a fix. 
there's an image file, you burn it to a disk, you, you put that disk in your machine, you hold a certain sequence of buttons, and it boots up off the disk that you just loaded, and it rewrites its ROM to solve this problem that customers have encountered. Who would have thunk? Your camera, your digital camera, your car, basically everything that's built now that has a, is computer controlled has ROM. And the nice thing about it is once they release a product and they find bugs in it, they could fix those bugs and then you could reflash your ROM and sometimes restore a device, make it you know operational where before it wasn't. This is a really great tree that shows the different breakdowns of ROM. There's two primary families. One is TTL, which stands for Transistor, Transistor Logic. The other is MOS, Metal Oxide Semiconductor. You all know what a metal oxide semiconductor is. This is the stuff that basically is static sensitive, right? Bipolar, TTL, it's older technology, it's still used, but it's not as prevalent. We have two different types. One is called a mask ROM, mask ROM, and the other is called PROM. Mask ROM uses a mask, and what they do is when they manufacture the chip, they basically make that chip hold certain firmware and it's etched onto the chip. So every time you turn that chip on, it is what it is. So this would be really good if you're mass producing something low tech, drive the cost down, like, I don't know, maybe one of those tickle me Elmos or something, you're going to produce millions of them, you want it to be cheap, but yet you're using some technology in it, and you never want it to be modified or anything beyond what it is, where, you know, it is what it is, it's a tickle me Elmo. Put fresh batteries in it, and it does what it's whatever that thing does. Does this technology using TTL costs a little bit more money? It's called PROM. PROM, programmable read-only memory. So these chips could be bought blank, and then they could be programmed to write your particular unique application to it. For something like Tico Me Elmo, it wouldn't make sense. Not cost effective because you're mass producing so many of them. You're not going to buy these blanks. They cost considerably more. So engineers have to determine is it worth us doing mass ROM and mass producing? And then the other thing, too, is if you don't validate that software and you make a mistake and then you do the mask technique, and then now you've got like 47 million chips that all have the error in it, it's how you lose your job. Okay, that's how companies go under. So you got to be real careful on what you what you do. That's why a lot of prototypes will use PROMs, and then they'll make sure the bugs are worked out, and then they'll get that sacred software. Ooh, and then they'll do a mask ROM with it. Now all the new technologies over here on the right, MOS, metal oxide semiconductor. Metal oxide semiconductor has the mask ROM, works the same way as the TTL version does also has the PROM, programmable read-only memory. But what they did with metal oxide semiconductors is they were able to add a new technology called EEPROM. EEPROM stands for Erasable Programmable Read-Only Memory. And the way that these chips work is they had a little window on the top of them, glass window. And what would happen is if you put the chip under the influence of ultraviolet light, you could reset it back to its original state. So that would allow a company to write a program to it. Write a, and does anybody know what it's called when you write a program to one of these chips and how the program's contained on a chip? Does anybody know what we call that? It's got a unique word. Um, could be referred to as flash. But do we call it software? Do we call it hardware? Firmware, very good. When we write a program to the chip, it now becomes firmware. So with the little EEPROM, typically they'd write it to the chip and then they'd have a little sticker that they'd put over to show what version of firmware. It does two things, keeps light out of, off the chip so you don't reset it. Because if you did that, 
if you had these chips and you just got them and you left them outside for a day under UV light, it would erase them. The contents would be gone. So it's a good thing that the inside of your computer is not out in the sun. Actually, they don't use EEPROM anymore, but they used to. And it still is prevalent in a lot of legacy equipment that's out there. The new memory, the new kit on the block, if you will, that is the way that it is, is this EEPROM. Electrically erasable, programmable, read-only memory. If you've got a newer car, your car computer probably has an EEPROM in it. If you've got a digital camera, your digital camera probably has an EEPROM in it. Your DVD player, I mean, you name it, it's probably got an EEPROM in it. The way the EEPROM works is by putting together a certain set of conditions, certain voltages on certain pins, the chip could actually be reprogrammed. And it's really as easy as just plugging it in and going to town. Reprogramming that chip and now will contain the new contents of memory. So a couple of years ago I bought a new digital camera, brand new. I, I'm, not, I'm not the kind of guy that keeps up with the Joneses with electronics. You know, I'm happy with like let somebody else work the bugs out and then I'll get it like two years from now when it's really cheap. Um, I don't need to have the latest technology. But um, Olympus came out with this great camera. It was gyro stabilized and I remember, oh, <laughs> got to order this thing. So I pre-ordered it. So I mean it came in. It just, it was pre-ordered. It just came out. It, uh, I bought it from Dick's camera down in Burien. They gave me a call and they said, hey, you know, Mr. Grenick, your camera's in. I went and picked it up. I brought it home, I read the manual, and the very first thing I want you to do to register is plug it in the USB port, plug it in your computer, and then your computer phones home with the serial number and everything else. So I'm doing this, and then it comes up, warning, there's a new version of firmware to be installed in your camera. It's like, you've got to be kidding me. I just got this camera. It's brand spanking new. It was manufactured like last Tuesday. I can't believe that. So there must have been some glitch in that first version that came out. And right away they had a fix out there. And, you know, I always kind of get nervous if I, when you reflash the memory like that. It's a pretty safe process. But if something happens in the middle, like if your battery dies or something happens, um, it can end up screwing it up permanently. And you won't, you won't be able to, to revive it. So um, anyway, I reflashed it. It's been fine ever since. But this is really one of the reasons that I'm emphasizing this EEPROM. For all of you as electronic technicians and technical folks, I want you to look at this in the future. When something is wrong with a device that you're working on and needs to be troubleshot, one of the very first things you got to do is rule out the version of firmware that is installed. Look up and see if there's a new version. And if there is, you have to reflash that EEPROM. Then see if the symptoms are still present. It's the first thing that even your car your car is under warranty, you bring it into the dealership, first thing the dealership's going to look, is there a new version of firmware that's out there? So, fortunately, my, my Taurus, uh, my Taurus, 97 Taurus, uses this technology. It was really one of the first years, second year of OBD2, and um, I had some warranty work done on it. And that was the first thing they did as they looked, and guess what? Voila, there was a new version of firmware up there. So they had to get a, a special Ford sticker that they put under the hood and this, what the version of firmware is that's written on the chip and uh, they reflashed it. And I think that was the last version that they updated. You know, I've looked online and uh, that's the version I have is the last one. Because basically companies don't support it. After, after you generate a car and you're not getting customer complaints or whatever, if it's all good, let's not monkey with it. If people keep calling and saying, um, actually I had a student that did this, he had a GPS unit. And um, it was interesting because me, there were two, two students that had the same similar GPS model. I f would bring it, mine in my airplane. One of the guys used it for marine applications, and the other guy used it for off-road on his motorcycle. And what kept happening was is he'd be out driving in the boonies, and then his GPS it would basically reboot itself. And he thought it was something like with the power cord coming loose or something like that or whatever. What ended up happening was because it was the handlebar mount and there was so much motion, basically the, the, the GPS computer, there was so rapid change that it was sensing, it just didn't make sense of it. And eventually it would clog the whole computer up 
on board, computer, and then it would just reboot itself. So ironically, the fix to that was a firmware fix. He reflashed it with the latest firmware, put it on, took it for a drive, and he was insistent that it was like a problem with a loose cable and it was just the batteries getting disconnected internally or whatever. It was a firmware problem. And Garmin realized what the problem was, reflashed it, no more problem. He was like, wow, I never had such an easy fix. So keep that in mind if you have any device that has an EEPROM on it, um, which is really most devices now. I mean, it really is. Constantly firmware upgrades available. So, and there's a reason they're upgrading it. Something was wrong with the version that you have, so you gotta fix it. In summary, a flip-flop is a bi-stable multi-vibrator whose output is either high or low. Types of flip-flops include RS, which is set reset, clocked RS, D, JK. Flip-flops are used in digital circuits such as counters. A latch is a temporary buffer memory. A counter is a logic circuit that can count a sequence of numbers of states. A single flip-flop produces a count sequence of either 0 or 1. The maximum number of binary states a counter can have depends on the number of flip-flops contained in the counter. Because obviously one flip-flop will be your one's column, your next will be your two's column, your next will be your four's column, eights, 16's, 32, 64, 128, 256. You get the sequence? Straight binary. Counters can either be asynchronous or synchronous. Asynchronous counters are called ripple counters. Synchronous counters clock each stage at the same time. That's why they're called synchronous. They're synchronized. Shift registers are used to store data temporarily. They're constructed of flip-flops wired together. They can move data either to the left or to the right. Used for serial to parallel, parallel to serial data conversion. Also can perform multiplication and division. Any questions on Chapter 35. All right, let's go ahead and take a 10-12 uh, minute break. When we come back, Chapter 36, Combinational Logic Circuits. Home stretch.